myself and did. I school with a bit of blur. Drug and alcohol use that started. Out as recreational transformed into daily ritual. Booze and weed even to dash. Ally included hallucinogens. Cocaine and crank were added to the cock. Dash. Tail. Finally, I found crystal methamphetamine. I did meth for the first time during my senior year of high school. Something was different about this drug. I felt invincible. I felt like a god. I became a near daily meth user from the start. Meth became a swift wrecking ball in my life. Within three months of use, I had dropped out of high school and was stealing as a way to support my habit. When I first started stealing, I tried to have some semblance of ethics about it. Ridiculous as that sounds. I didn't steal from individuals. I didn't steal from cars. I didn't steal from homes. But my willingness to cross boundaries with stealing followed a similar progression as mine. Willingness to try increasingly harder drugs, and I eventually found my dash. Self-stealing whatever I could get my hands on. At 18, I was arrested for a string of burglaries and sentenced to more than five years in prison. I paroled at the legal age for drinking. During my time in county jail, in prison, and on parole, I was introduced to recovery. Twice, I stayed in 30-day residential treatment facilities and was exposed to 12-step programs. I went to meetings and superficially did what was asked of me, even though it looked like I was. In recovery, I wasn't actually doing recovery. My goal was not to stay so. Dash. Fear but was, instead, to look good for parents, judges, and parole agents. Though I had decided that I would never use hard drugs like meth again, I had no designs on staying completely sober. I wanted to drink and smoke pot when life circumstances would allow for it. I started drinking again while I was on parole and, as soon as my state supervision ended, I resumed smoking pot. I used successfully, like, this for a couple of years, I was going to college and doing well, I had a, great job, relationships with family were mostly restored, I had nothing, to be concerned about, around this time, I took an eastern philosophy course in college, and was introduced to the teachings of the Buddha, I read about the four noble truths and the three characteristics of existence and felt a great sense of familiarity with them, like they represented a truth that I known all along but had somehow forgotten. I just knew the Dharma to be true but, at the same time, I decided that I wasn't suffering enough to worry about it just yet. I would get my chance. A couple of years after leaving prison, one of my closest child, Dash, good friends committed suicide in a very violent manner. It was the flow, Dash, as death had come in my life thus far and it shook me. I felt like the world was crumbling in on me that I'd been emotionally and spiritually shaken from a foundation. I didn't know how to cope with the way I felt, and I didn't have the inner resources to ask for help. I became a daily drinker and relapsed on methamphetamine a few months later.
I started stealing again and my life snowballed in the same way. It had seven years earlier. Overwhelmed with sadness, beset with remorse. For the harm I was causing yet again, and burdened with shame at that. Thought of seeking help, I considered suicide but got loaded instead. And, imperfect solution, the drugs saved me from myself. Yet again, I was arrested for a string of burglaries. I found my, dash, self-facing centuries in prison under California's three strikes law. In the, county jail and without the option of getting loaded, my suffering was in, dash, escapable. My sadness was inescapable. My remorse was inescapable. My, shame, my suicidal ideation, everything, was inescapable. I was forced to, look everything square in the face. There's a reason that the first noble truth is about suffering. No, transformative path begins without it. Convinced that my life couldn't, possibly get any worse than it was at the moment, I decided upon two things. First, I would try my hand at recovery. The worst thing that could happen was nothing. Second, recalling the Buddhism I'd encountered in college three years earlier, I'd give meditation in the Dharma A tribe. That was in 2005. There was no mindfulness or Buddhist base. Recovery available, so finding recovery and following the Dharma started. Out as separate paths, on one hand, I started going to 12-step meetings. In the county jail, found a sponsor on the streets, and began the process of writing inventories and making amends. On the other hand, I started meditating as best as I knew how, without a teacher, the internet, or a saying, dash, Ah, I relied solely upon the books that family would generously send me. I completely misused meditation when I first started practice. Instead of using meditation as a method for meeting reality, I used it as an escape. In this way, meditation served as a substitute for the drugs I no longer had easy access to. I do not judge myself for using my practice. This way in the beginning, in so many ways, it was exactly what I needed. At the time, I would eventually develop the skills to face my reality more squarely, but it would take time. After a year and a half in the county jail, I accepted a plea bargain of 14 years in prison. By the time I arrived in Folsom State Prison, later that year, I'd been clean from drugs and alcohol for nearly two years. I was prepared to start mentoring other incarcerated men in recovery and my meditation practice was becoming consistent. At Folsom, I finally sat in meditation with other people. Two nights per week, I met with Sangha in the fabled Greystone Chapel. F.A. Dash. Facilitated by volunteers from the outside, these groups were where I really came to understand what mindfulness practice was about. I finally had fellows on the path, and I finally had teachers. Both were absolutely NEC. Dash. Essary to the flourishing of my meditation and Dharma practice. Every afternoon during count, loud buzzers would sound off. In the cell block. So, every afternoon, half an hour before count time. I rolled up a blanket and sat on the floor of my cell. 
the prison would be my timer. My meditation changed dramatically. No longer was it a method of escape. Instead, it became a method inquiry. In the beginning, it was simple. What was it like to breathe? What was it like to sit on my rolled up blanket? What was the nature of the sounds in my cell block? With practice, I started to see that the present moment wasn't as bad as I thought it was. In fact, the present moment, when I wasn't actually thinking about it, was mostly neutral and oftentimes pleasant. This was a bit of a breakthrough for me, because some part of me was convinced that I was supposed to be miserable in prison. Yes, being in prison was awful. Yes, being away from friends and family was awful. Yes, washing my clothes in the toilet was awful. Yes, yes, yes. But, in time, I came to realize that these things were only awful. Insofar as I found myself mesmerized by my own narratives about them. My stories about my life were the problem, and I had a lot of them. Prison, I could not escape. There was no freedom from prison. While I was living there, there was, however, freedom from my story. About it, I did not have to take prison personally. This insight carried me through the remainder of my prison sentence and into the outside world. I paroled after seven years of incarceration. There was still no mindfulness or Buddhist-based recovery, so I continued to do in the free world what I had done inside, attend recovery meetings and meditation groups separately. Though I was immensely grateful for the recovery pro dash gram I had, I nonetheless translated a great deal of the 12-step program into Buddhist terms and practices which better aligned with the way I moved through the world. Finally, after 10 years of renunciation from Drugs and alcohol, a Buddhist-based path of recovery was developed and I helped to establish it in my local area. This program eventually became the recovery dharma of today. I no longer needed to translate my pro dash gram of recovery. Since coming home, I have found that six things have been in dash Brawl to my continued growth in recovery and as a human being. Medida, dash, Tion, meetings, study, service, friends, teachers. I meditate every day and try to participate in a minimum of two silent retreats every year. I regularly attend recovery meetings and other Buddhist meditation groups. I study the teachings of the Buddha in order to develop a deeper understanding of ways to implement them. In my life, I take on service positions in my recovery dharma groups and share the message of recovery and of the dharma wherever I can. I maintain friendships with people who nurture and support my own growth. I regularly meet with both a mentor and a Buddhist teacher in order to navigate difficulties in practice and continue to move forward on the path. My life has been both challenging and beautiful since coming home from prison more than a decade ago. I have completed state supervision and graduated from Universe. Dash. City. I have completed a five-year trade apprenticeship and become an elected union official. I have gotten married to a wonderful woman in recovery and become a homeowner. I've traveled to Buddhist pilgrimage 
sites in India and participated in extended meditation retreats at home and abroad. I have received lay ordination within a Buddhist tradition and started teaching the Dharma to people in California prisons. I have also navigated complex PTSD and started to unlearn free. Dash on survival strategies that were no longer useful to me. I have been present for death when it sweeps through and survived life-altering heart surgery. Mindfulness, heartfulness, and community are what made and continue to make all of these possible. As one of my teachers has said, Dharma practice has the capacity to transform the very nature of suffer. Dash. Ing. Awakening might not come in the form of sudden moments of rev. Dash. Elation, but instead may entail the gradual digestion of pain and trauma. Over the years, I have progressively come to see the good that has come from past suffering and I try my best to carry that perceptive in the press. Dash. End moment, reshaping it with wisdom and love. One line from recovery. Dharma's dedication of merit stands out to me, as we have learned from. Practice. Great pain does not erase goodness, but in fact informs it. This isn't just a platitude, it's a promise. Berlinda. Content warning. Childhood sex abuse. My story shows how a person can go from real hardship to a life of balance using community, prayer, the four noble truths and the eightfold path. Trauma made me want to numb myself with substance. Dash. S and my practice has allowed me to feel those feelings from the past without reaching out to something to harm myself further. My childhood was pretty rough. I was raised by a woman who was a sex worker and when I turned 11 years old, she started to traffic me as well. I learned to leave my body and disassociate because that was the only way I could deal with it. I lived that way for a long time. My mother didn't allow us to play with other children of color. We would get meetings for that even though she was dark. A. Morena, herself. Eventual. Dash. Lee, I was placed in a children's mental institution because I stopped talking. I was there for a couple years before they sent me back to my mother. When I got home, one of my abusers was visiting my mother so. I ran away the first day I came back. As soon as I saw him at the top of the steps, I took off. There was a local delivery boy who I liked and he left me hang out at his apartment while he was working. I told him I didn't want to go back home and about what was going on there. He told me that when he came back from work he would have something for me and that ended up being a bottle. I took that first drink and it felt like, my God, where have you been? Everything disappeared from my mind. I just wanted to have fun. I was giggly for the first time in a very long time. I had stopped going to school during the third grade. There were no social services at the time, at least for my neighborhood. You didn't see them unless the school complained. I was in and out of Jew. Dash. Venal detention and one female lawyer told me I was inappropriate. Dash. Lee dressed for court and gave me her own stockings to wear for the proceedings. I wanted to stay with her because she was nice to me. 
At 15, I was emancipated from my mother and began work. Dash. Being at a bar, this older lady I met on the bus asked me if I wanted to work. I thought it was going to be cleaning houses or something but when I asked her what she wanted me to do she told me about the bar. The first day I went in for the interview, I had never been inside a bar B. Dash. Four and they were putting all these shot glasses in front of me and I asked. The lady, Miss, Mary, what the shot glasses were for. She told me eagerly that men were buying me drinks. Since I didn't like the taste of alcohol, she taught me how to make a lemon drop chaser with a slice of lemon. Covered in sugar, I got hooked on those. I drank for the sensation. I got myself ready for drinks. It was a treat. This was in 1970 at the Golden Flipper on Webster Avenue in the Bronx. Eventually I found out the go-go dancers at the bar made a lot more money than I did, so I started doing that. I liked it because I didn't actually have to get involved with the men, it was all an illusion. I go. Go danced for nine years and made a lot of money. I worked long hours at different places around the city and I drank through all of it. I didn't know that I had crossed that invisible line of addiction. I would isolate and drink. I didn't want to share my drink. I would get territorial with my alcohol. I would keep cups of alcohol around my apartment in Dipper. Dash. And room. One in the bathroom next to the toothbrush. One next to the bed which I would reach for as soon as I woke up in the morning. I gave birth to my daughter when I was almost 18. My mother took her because it was either sign her over to my mother or release her to the system. I didn't raise her myself because I couldn't stay with my mother, and I thought that at least I could still see her if she's with family. I met my husband in the neighborhood. We went to a party together and he came home with me and never left. When I met him, he was sniffing heroin and drinking but I made him stop the heroin. He said if I stopped dancing he would marry me the next year. We had a son. And, when he was three, my husband wanted us to move to Virginia Beach. Dash. Because his family was down there. We both got jobs. He did maintenance. I cleaned houses. He started getting abusive to the point where I would check into a psych ward for the weekend just to get away from him for a while. I applied for a job at the Department of Corrections stop and he hid the acceptance letter from me under the mattress. He didn't want me making more money because he wouldn't have as much control over me. In May 1990, I received my first paycheck from the docks, and I got my own apartment. I put up bunk beds and gave my son the bed, dad, room while I slept out in the living room on a day bed. During my second or third year at the dock, I went to a party with fellow officers and they had a lot of coke. So me and another girl went into the kitchen and started cooking in. At the time it was called freebasing. Before I left the party that night, I was addicted. I ultimate dash. We stopped using crack because of my son. I went to my major and told her I had a problem, and they sent me to rehab. 
I was sober for a long time until I met Kina working at him. Job at Great Adventure. We figured out a scam where we could pocket ticket money directly, and one day we made $1,500 each. Kina wanted to score drugs with the money, and I told her I would have just a little bit. But we were up all night long. That's when it started up again. We moved up to New Jersey together with my son because he had gotten kicked out of high school in Virginia. He didn't want me to be with Tina, and so he moved out, which hurt me. He felt like I kicked her over him, but I felt like my personal relationships were none of his business. I started having feelings for women when I started dancing, but I didn't take it seriously until later. My son knew that I was gay. I had met another woman previously and we were married. It's not like it is today. So we had what was called a holy union. The ceremony took place at a gay church and the pastor asked us what colors we were using in our wedding and we told him purple and silver. He wore purple and silver vestments for our ceremony. She was always good to me. Even after we broke up she helped me raise my son, and they're still in touch to this day. She helped me pay rent and got me a new truck, but all that stopped once. Tina came into my life. Tina and I would argue over who did more of the drugs. I tried to solve our problems by moving, but as soon as we set foot in our new town she was out looking for drugs again. I found a job working for an elderly lady, and she had two large pickle jars full of quarters at her home, and Tina went in there and stole all that lady's money. And, of course, I got fired. One day when Kina didn't come home, I called Catholic Charities and they put me in a hotel and got me a ticket out of there. Something told me to not look back or say goodbye or nothing. I was so concerned with getting away from her I didn't notice the day then. Months of sobriety stacking up. Eventually I came back to New York and started hanging out with the wrong people and picked up crack again. It was something F.A. Dash. Familiar. I lost my apartment and found myself living in an abandoned building with a bunch of other drug users. I moved to a shelter which is where I attended my first 12-step meeting. I went to so many meetings that the facilitator told me I was ready for a meeting outside the shelter. It was on Broadway between 106th and 107th Street. That became my home group and the shelter found me in a park. Dash. Meant and I moved back to the Bronx. Twelve steps showed me that I was mine. Own worst enemy and that the only reason I am where I am today is for the grace of God. He was my rehab, for real. He keeps it simple for me. It still felt like I needed something else, like something was missed. Dash, King, I was surfing the net one day during the height of the 2020 pandemic. Dash. I see and I found recovery dharma and went to an online meeting. The spirituality of it was very attractive to me, even though I was new to this type of fellowship. When people spoke I really identified with what they were saying. I asked about a sponsor, 
or in this case, a mentor, and they hooked me up with another woman who is also